Good evening, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President. Um, it's very wonderful to be with you all. My name is Zainab Badawi. Um, I'm a broadcaster. I also chair the Royal African Society, take a great deal of interest in this kind of issue. And we are here, some of you I, I recognize from last year when we were discussing the inaugural session here at the uh, UN General Assembly of the Global Deal. So now we are a year on and we are going to be discussing how to advance the Global Deal what we've achieved in the uh, final year, what the obstacles have been, and just whether we can chart a path for the future. And as most of you know, of course, the Global Deal um, looks to creating a dialogue, a social dialogue between governments, business, and trades unions. And the idea is that um, it draws its inspiration trying to achieve goal eight, which is for decent work, decent jobs, and inclusive growth, and also SDG 17, which is all about partnerships to achieve these goals. Um, we've got a lot of wonderful speakers, so I'm going to keep quiet and say that our first speaker, Mr. Prime Minister, hello, Stefan Lovien. How do you like my Swedish? Uh, that was good enough. Uh, yeah, many, good enough. Swe <laughs> <laughs> many Swedes cannot pronounce it that well as you did. Yeah, so. yeah, but your English is better than my Swedish, <laughs> let's face it. Um, Stefan Lovien, so we were together last year, weren't we? We had a very, very good time. And, yeah. you know, listening to your um, vision, because uh, it was very much your initiative, but I know now it's broadened out and we've got so many more stakeholders, but we would like to do more. But you know, you're, you're trying to create this global deal for social dialogue, for inclusive growth and decent work. So it's a very, against a very difficult background. A lot of people are skeptical about globalization, the fact that it hasn't really brought benefits to everybody. You know, the Chinese saying, a rising tide does not lift all boats. And I think a lot of people feel that their boats have not been Mm. you know, raised. Mm. So how can you advance the global dialogue against this uh, difficult background, but also give us an idea of um, what you've managed to achieve in the past year? Thank you so much. Uh, first, um, I'm very glad to be here and to meet all of you and to meet uh, Angela and, and uh, Guy also, who we, we, we launched the Global Deal together uh, a year ago. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and see how it, the progress uh, that we have made First, let us let us note that I mean globalization means also positive things. We have to we have to bear that in, in our minds that of course we want this world to develop as a whole. We we know that not least for Sweden, being a small country, we're very export oriented. Uh, we need we we believe in the global economy, in, in the open and fair trade, and and, and so on. Uh, technology is spreading all over the world, and we know that we have reduced poverty. Uh, the worst forms of poverty. We have a growing middle class uh, in the world. Uh, more and more boys and girls go to school every day, which is a progress that has been made. But at the same time, we see these winding gaps. Uh, I said earlier in, in this in this hall that um, some years ago, just a few years ago, Oxfam told us that uh, some 50, 60 people, uh, the richest people in the world, own as much as the poorest half of the population, meaning 3.5 billion people, so 50 people owning as much as 3.5 billion. That's not longer a fact, because today you can count to 10 people. So the 10 richest people in the world own as much as 3.5 billion of the poorest. And that's a sign that there's something wrong. Uh, we have also uh, refugee crisis, climate crisis, uh, conflicts, uh, very serious conflicts, not least in the Korean Peninsula right now. So that's the other side of the coin. And we have more and more people believing we are not controlling this development at all. It's happening. And I'm being a subject to, to, to change that I cannot control. And I think that's the worst scenario that we can have, because if people feel that they are out of control, that's really, really bad. And when that happens, uh, you know, extremists and populists, and those who are against uh, globalization as an idea, they gain terrain. And we can see that, uh, not least in Europe right now, with uh, neo-Nazis and, and those who attract people that feel despair. People, when people feel despair, they are attracted to extremists. 
And that is uh, one of the, the reasons why we need to do something very fast. And then, of course, the reason is the basic that we want all human beings to have a good life. We want all human beings in the world to, to look forward to the future, not being afraid of the future. We want them to long for tomorrow. Now, the social dialogue, the global deal, is essential in that. Because if you have a dialogue, a constant dialogue on this change, this development, how are we going to cope with it? Not only cope, how are we going to make sure that everyone benefits from the global economy? And that means, in my world, that is my, my whole work and life experience has shown me that you can, you can do so much together. One plus one can be more than two, it can be three. Uh, so this is not about different stakeholders fighting against each other. This is about how we create a win-win-win situation. Uh, when, when workers have decent working conditions, yes, that's a benefit for workers. But I can say at the same time, with uh, decent working conditions, uh, productivity will increase. You will have more uh, engaged staff in your companies, uh, employees in the companies, because they see, yes, uh, I have a positive future uh, uh, in this connection. So, and the society will gain as well, because if enterprises are more pro productive, uh, that will gain. Uh, the society will gain. And then you have to find out who is doing what in this in this uh, cooperation. Uh, what 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 is the responsibility for the trade union, the, the employees? What's the responsibility for the employers, the enterprises, and what's the responsibility for the society? to make this happen. And that could be different from different parts of the world, different countries, because we have different backgrounds, different history. But we have to find a way to, to, to make sure that this um, development is, is, is good for everyone. And that's indeed what we're going to be trying to do, see if we can find a way. Prime Minister, thank you so much. Angel Gurria, you are Director General of the OECD, also a former finance minister in your native Mexico, and you know how difficult it is to implement some of the things that the Prime Minister has been talking about when you look around you, OECD countries and further afield, you know, the stagnant wages, the inequalities that people, you know, workers complain about. So just how does the global deal really fit into all this as a tool to try to um, break down these issues, these problems? The uh, social dialogue which is uh, implicit uh, in the um, global deal, the, what I would call the, the transformational, the, the functional element of the global deal, uh, really has to look at all of society uh, and here uh, it's obviously the governments, the trade unions, business, um, civil society. Now, uh, we're talking about a, uh, a uh, workforce which is less and less unionized. Um, and we're talking about a workforce which is more individualized as we move more and more into services. The more you, you know, the, the, the high uh, percentages of unionization are basically having to do with uh, more in the manufacturing uh, sector. Uh, as you go into services, you have, and, and, and you know, services are 70, 75, 80% of our economies at the OECD, and even in a you know, country like China, services are now more than 50% of, of the worth of the economy. And so that's where the action is, and that's where we should focus uh, for the future. But it means also that uh, you have to create different forms of the social dialogue, and the, of course, even of social protection. When you're talking about skilling, upskilling, reskilling the workforce in order to adapt it to a growing digitalization. It, in fact, it's not about a, the digital economy, but about an economy that already went digital. Huh? Mm. How do you adapt the workforce? Because about 9 to 10% of the workforce today is, we have, you know, we found out in our research, is basically in danger of being substituted by technology, by robotization, etc. But there's another 25% of the workforce 
one full uh, fourth, which together with this nine, ten percent, you mean one full third of the workforce that will either be substituted or disrupted in their workplace. For that, we really need to prepare uh, not only the workforce, but society at large. So basically, what you're talking about here is a whole making the social dialogue a very deep, a very profound, lever, 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 leverage the social dialogue uh, into effectively what is uh, moving the whole of the economy, the whole of the society, into the 21st century. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Angel Gurria. Um, Guy Ryder, Director General of the ILO, the International Labour Organization, based there in Geneva. Interesting what um, Angel Gurria had to say, that actually you're beginning to see um, fewer and fewer members of the workforce who are unionized. So when you're talking about that within the context of the social dialogue, does it really help advance the social dialogue if you're saying, let's include the trades unions if they are representing an ever-diminishing portion of the workforce? Yeah, I, I think there is a reality of, uh, of reduced union density in, in many countries. The, the country where I, I come from, uh, when I worked in the trade union movement, we had 13 million members. I don't know what they've done since I left. They've only got 6 million now. I often wonder what my colleagues have done. Well, you shouldn't but, have left. But it remains no. still the biggest voluntary body of people and representative structure in the country, so I think we have to relativize at that point. But let me start from the general and go a little bit more to the specific. Uh, I want to sort of suggest that um, dialogue, I, I use the word in its most generic sort of expression, is a public good. I think we live at a time uh, when dialogue is becoming extremely difficult in all sorts of uh, scenario, including international relations. Anybody coming to the General Assembly, I think, might bear that in mind. And I think we should be worried when we stop talking to each other. It's like a relationship. When you stop talking to each other, you have a problem, generally speaking. So dialogue is um, a public good, in my view, because it is a problem-solving mechanism. And if you relate to the world of work, which is obviously where our focus is with the global deal, uh, social dialogue is a public good in the sense uh, that it helps society to deal with difficult questions in the world of work in a manner which is both fair, and I think as Prime Minister Lufan has indicated, people are looking for a greater degree of fairness, is inclusive. If people are listened to, they tend to buy into solutions uh, more than they otherwise would. And it's a very good way of taking the sharp edges off uh, inequality and exclusion, some of the things that worry us very much in our societies. And being here in New York and we're looking at the 2030 agenda, I think we see that social dialogue is very, very much in the spirit of the 2030 agenda, as you've, you've indicated at the outset. Now, these are all very fine general sentiments, and we could all agree that it's very good to talk to each other. But I think uh, to take the global deal forward uh, and to win uh, more and more support for it, I think we have to make a much sort of sharper, I'm going to call it a business case for social dialogue. Why and how is it good for companies, not just for workers, but for enterprises, for our society and for our economies. And uh, we produced a, a small pamphlet with, with seven interesting examples of how uh, the, the precisely this happens. And let me just sort of telegraphically signal some of the elements of the business case. You take our Tunisian colleagues where, you know, social dialogue has been perhaps the most important method through which democratic process has been preserved in that country recognized in, a, in, in the Nobel uh, a Peace uh, Prize for the, the social dialogue partners. You look at the impact of the 2008 crisis, um, which were the countries which navigated the crisis best in terms of employment and, 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 and growth? It was those countries which had good and effective institutions and traditions of social dialogue. And uh, I don't want to spare the Prime Minister's blushes, but uh, Sweden was one country which, which did that. Um, but also, we have very strong evidence uh, that social dialogue uh, rebounds uh, very, very clearly and very, very, very positively to company productivity. Uh, companies which have good avenues and channels of, 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 of dialogue perform very, very well. And one can go on. Training mechanisms which have tripartite inputs, they're very, very good. They're efficient. These are 
problem-solving, efficient mechanisms of labor market governance. It's a very, very solid, uh, very, very objective assessment. And I, I think these are the, uh, the issues that we need to bring to the fore as we push forward with the global dialogue. Just very quickly, is it a dialogue of equals? that you're talking about? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, not always. I mean, the rapport de force can, can vary enormously, mm. I think. But it is generally a mistake to believe that you come out ahead if you take advantage of the weakness of the person yeah. on the other side of the table. There might be a short-term win, but you pay for it. And, and confidence and trust and reciprocity, I think, in the end, uh, is what pays out if you take the longer-term approach to life. You started it, off by saying... It's not, a, it's not a dialogue of equals in the, in the following sense, because everybody has a different role. Yeah. You see, the, the employers, the uh, employees, uh, whether they're unionized or not, and then the government, but all of them are indispensable to make it work. Yeah, good. Final word to you there before I finish with this panel. No, I mean, we, we, that's two examples. Uh, there will always be new technology that we know. There will be restructuring. We know that as well. Now, the thing is, how do, we, how do we make people feel at least more confident in this restructuring? And that's a social dialogue when you, when you agree upon the, the conditions for this. And if you have people afraid, I mean, when I was a, a local trade union leader, we, the, the blue collar workers in our company, we rationalized a part of that company. We made it 30% more efficient. 30%. How was that possible? Because I knew uh, in this part of the production, a third of, of the, the workers would need another job. It was possible because I could tell them in the other part of the company, there's a job for you. And if you need retraining, a training to get that job, we'll make sure you have that training. Mm -hmm. So they could say, okay, this is a change. It will not be easy. But of course, I will be fine after this as well. Now, if you scale that to a national perspective. You have to do the same. How do you make sure in this restructuring that people feel, well, I will not be unemployed for a long time. Mm. I will be helped with training. If I'm unemployed, I will have a financial situation that, uh, that doesn't make me uh, uh, go under. So these kind of issues we need to discuss. Thank you all very much indeed, gentlemen. If um, you would be so kind as uh, to take your seat on the... To get out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And may I ask Sheikh Hasina, President Vasquez, <laughs> Philip Winnie. Oh, I'm staying here. Yes, I'm staying here for the whole session. Oh, I'm staying here. It's fine. They didn't, uh, he didn't use it. Thank you. That was the... Um, the three gentlemen there kicking off the um, opening discussion. And um, I'm now going to welcome to the stage President Vasquez, who is uh, sitting there, Sheikh Hasina. So President Vasquez, of course, you know, is the president of Uruguay, and he will be speaking in Spanish. Sheikh Hasina, hello, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. I have my next group of guests here. So we're going to start with you, Sheikh Hasina, um, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And uh, of course, I should say, just everybody wishes your country every success in trying to deal with this huge influx of uh, refugees that you are having to uh, cope with in your country. But we are talking here about the um, social dialogue. And Bangladesh is one of the countries that has signed up to this um, idea of, of a dialogue and uh, really I wanted to ask you what are you doing at um, country level to try to implement some of these principles and also how you've been scaling up initiatives so this is an, a chance for us to hear what countries have done we're going to hear from from Bangladesh and also from Uruguay but Sheikh Hasina if you'd be so kind I see you have some you've come prepared 
Prime Minister. You've come prepared with your speech. Okay, well, <laughs> be my guest. A few words I have to of be course. prepared and then I can will give you an answer. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, good evening. In the last nine years, we have been strengthening democracy in Bangladesh. As you know that uh, we suffered from military dictatorship for a long time. So we have to struggle to establish democracy. Our relentless efforts have also been successful in achieving tremendous economic and social progress. We have brought pro labor changes in labor relations. These advances have contributed to uplifting the work condition. As we embark upon promoting global deal in collaboration with Sweden, our commitment for the protection of human rights and labor rights remains steadfast. We look at the protection of labor rights as an internal par integral part of our economy and society. We believe that if the overall socioeconomic development is ensured, it will eventually enhance decent jobs and labor rights. Due to various pro-development actions taken by the government, per capita income of our citizens has almost tripled over the last nine years and significant achievements in poverty alleviation has been made. The minimum wages of government workers was increased threefold in past five years. These have contributed in ensuring better life, livelihood, and working environment and income stability of workers. The government of Bangladesh has started implementing the Better Work Program. We have undertaken massive training programs under the Social Dialogue and Harmonious Industrial Relations Project. The Tripartite Consultative Council dedicated for addressing the RMG sector labor issues uh, has been established. The aim of the the Patriot Council is to support social dialogue in the labor sector of Bangladesh for achieving harmonious industrial relations. The council is composed of members from government, labor leaders, and business community and employers. And in the RMG sector, as you know, that most of the women are working. So we have to make sure that uh, also we are pursuing and also assisting the owner of the industry to develop a good environment for living condition of our women uh, labor force. We are uh, building hostels or dormitories for them. We give uh, money to the organization with just 2% service charge from bank to build up um, hostel or dormitories for labor, especially for women, and also for training, training as well as for their establishment. So that way, we are trying our best to assist our labor force and also people. And are you finding business is helping? So you're the government doing this. You talked about the labor force obviously welcoming these initiatives, the minimum wage and the rest of it. And you find that businesses in Bangladesh, are they also part of this dialogue? Oh, yes, of Very course. Well, being head of the government, sometimes I discuss with the owner and then uh, to increase the wages, definitely we pursue them. But of course, we have to give some uh, facilities for the owner also. Otherwise, they don't you know, agree to increase You've got to the make it worth wages. their while. So mm. in one hand, you have to put pressure. Side by side, you have to give them some opportunity so that they can run their business easily and efficiently. I think that the, way. the phrase is enlightened self-interest. <laughs> you can appeal to well, within, business look, to do within, that. Within nine years, like I, ca I can give you an example. Like in our taka money, it was only 1,600 taka per month the wages, then I, I talked to them. At first stage, they increased it uh, 3,000. And next, 
5,500 within this period. Mm -hmm. That means they triple the wages. But definitely, the, uh, yeah. the owner of the industry always wants some facilities, extra facilities. So we provided that. But we must see the interest of the labor. Mm -hmm. And also for the ch children of the women labor, we established a care center, then for medical uh, facilities. Very interesting. And uh, the, for parents, yeah. and then uh, for the labor, those who are working whole day, so they are bit a meal facilities. Those right. so, some yeah. other facilities they are providing. Thank you yes. very much. And it's not just in, in developing nations. Such no, as I, I, talk to, I talk to our business community that, look, I am here. Yeah. I'm not only the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, but I am also working the job of the Prime Minister. I feel that it is for the labor, farmer, and downtrodden people, especially for them, I am here. So I want to... Um, assist our people so that they can get a better life. Mm. I was about to say, it's not just in developing countries. You know, in the United Kingdom, there was a report that women are more likely to not earn the minimum wage because they don't. So it's a, a point well made. I, I'd like to go to Uruguay now, leave Asia and go to Latin America. President Vasquez, welcome to you. Thank you so much. So again, um, I know you're going to speak in Spanish, but we have the help of your delightful interpreter there. Um, again, you know, what are you doing on the ground to make these principles come about and just how you are trying to scale up these initiatives in your country? Okay. Thank okay. you. Firstly, thank you so much, Fair Minister, for your invitation. And secondly, I... I will speak in Spanish, my mother language. Nuestro país, Uruguay, ha implementado y se ha comprometido voluntariamente con el acuerdo global a través de las siguientes medidas concretas. Our country, Uruguay, has implemented and has voluntarily pledged to the global deal through the following concrete measures. Primero, Promoción de la cultura del trabajo como directriz estratégica del gobierno nacional. First, encouragement of the culture of work as a strategic island of the national government. Segundo, implementación del primer programa tripartito de trabajo decente en nuestro país. Second, deployment of the first three-party program for teachers in our country. Tercero, ampliación de la cobertura de seguridad social y de salud a través de un sistema nacional de cuidados que abarca a tres poblaciones fundamentalmente, el adulto mayor, la niñez y sobre todo la mujer embarazada. Third, enlargement of social and health insurance through national system of care that involves the main three groups, senior citizens, children, and pregnant women. In 10 years, and in cuarto lugar, hubo un incremento de la tasa de empleo fundamentado en el crecimiento del empleo, sobre todo en las mujeres, que pasó de 43.7% en 2006 a un 50.1% en 2016. Number four, in 10 years, the growth of the employment, employment rate based on the growth of employment of women at the workforce that was raised from 43.7% 43, 43 in 2006 to 50.1% in 2016. En quinto lugar, evolucionó el salario real entre 2005, que llegamos al gobierno, y 2016 en un aumento de un 55.1%. Five, the improvement of the real wages between 2005 when I took over government until uh, 2016 with resulting in 55.1%. En sexto lugar, la variación real del salario mínimo nacional entre 2015, que llegamos 
a un nuevo periodo de gobierno y 2017 fue de un 137%. Six, the change of the national real minimum wage that between 2015, when the new government took over, and 2017 was of 137%. En séptimo lugar, políticas macroeconómicas responsables que permitieron un crecimiento económico de nuestro país ininterrumpido en los últimos 15 años, lo que repercutió en un incremento de la inversión extranjera directa con una reinversión en el entorno del 61%. 7. The accountable macroeconomic policies that enabled a constant economic growth during the last 15 years, which impacted the growth of the foreign investment and the reinvestment of 61%. Estos crecimientos se basan fundamentalmente en un estado profundo democrático, en una participación de todos los actores y en la búsqueda de equilibrios políticos y sociales. This cruise is based basically in democracy, where all participants are partners, and it has helped the growth of all social levels of our economy. Thank you so much indeed, Mr. President, um, especially your last comment on just reminding us how initiatives like the social dialogue are very much a cornerstone of democracy. Thank you very much indeed, and also to your brilliant interpreter there. Thank you. Philip Jennings. You are um, Secretary General of the Uni Global Trade Union, which is a private um, services, private sector mm -hmm. services union based in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about um, incentives for business to be part of the, um, the dialogue? I Less think the, it's a win-win case, as the Prime Minister said, for, for business in, in, in all respects. First of all, when you look at the question of productivity, when you look at dealing with transformational change, when you look at the demands that society are making on business in terms of their respect for human rights, when you look at what consumers are demanding of business in terms of where the goods are produced, how the goods are produced, and what conditions goods are produced on, Given the new pressures and dynamics on the business community, engaging with the workforce, recognizing the trade union movement, and working with them through the process of social dialogue and uh, collective bargaining, I consider it a win-win. Unfortunately, we would like them to share this perspective. And I think we, we like the global deal in that regard. It is an invitation to the business community to discover some good business common sense about engaging with the workforce and engaging with your most important stakeholder. We take matters into our own hand. Please don't accept the fact that we're not organizing. We are organizing in numbers in the services sector that we've never seen. But the dynamics, as Angel said, of the services economy is very different. I have unions signing up 100,000 members a year for a net gain of two to 3,000. We are signing people up, but to sign them up, we need to get access. We need to have an environment where the labor law helps us and where the, the framework for organizing works. We have faced so much opposition, principally political, uh, to which, which means we can't have the oxygen to organize. We have two union officials here, Their union has grown by 150,000 in the last four years. We have more women in membership, more women leaders in membership. If you ask the millennials what they think about us, then we have the best kind of opinion poll numbers that we've seen. There is a case to deal with the shocks. There is a case to deal with an ethical supply chain. I'm very happy with the work that we've done in Bangladesh with the Bangladesh Accord. We had a conversation today in Paris with the Bangladesh garment manufacturers about the continuation of the accord. It's a very good example of a strong message to the world that social dialogue works and it makes business sense to do this. If not, then 200 businesses wouldn't have signed up for the Bangladesh Accord when we started with zero. Philip, thank you so much for your very robust intervention. <laughs> 
power to you. Great. Thank you. I was, I'm just getting warmed up. Just getting warmed up. You, you, <laughs> I know. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm waiting for a I'd hate bath. to see you when you're warmed up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was just clearing his throat, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. But the passion, the passion Fabulous. is out there amongst our membership. The passion and the, the compassion. The passion is there. Great. Yes. I'm with you. Matt's Granrid. You are Director General of GSMA, which is the International Mobile Association, which is a kind of umbrella organization for the mobile operators. You've seen the gauntlet's been thrown in your direction, business. Are you going to rise to the challenge? Absolutely. I'm yeah. equally passionate, but maybe not so vocal as my <laughs> colleague to the right there. It was great sitting here listening to you both, both directions. No, but I, I think if we take the mobile industry, now you might wonder, why, why am I sitting here? Why, you know, mobile industry, the mobile operators were competing like, like never before. It's a cutthroat market for us as an industry. But there's one thing that we do agree on, and that is that the SDGs is something that is critically important for exactly the reasons you said. It is important for our customers. It is important to attract and retain top talent that we're thriving on. And it is so important that we have uh, agreed on a common purpose, common vision. We are connecting everyone and everything to a better future. And that better future is, is the SDGs. We are also, mind you, connecting over 5 billion people. 5 billion people. It is an awesome power, an awesome platform to advocate and have an outreach on, on the, the betterment of mobile. Every year we launch a report called the Impact Report, and uh, now I just gave it away to the office of the Swedish Prime Minister, but you have one there, I hope. And, but what it says is that we're actually doing good progress on all 17 goals. When we started this work, we didn't think that we would do that, but on all 17 goals. And I have so many great examples from our members, the mobile operators, what they are doing to achieve uh, betterment and achieve SDG targets. One example is that the industry is, is growing tremendously. There is a huge amount of money being put in and investing into the fintech area. I just came from San Francisco last year, and I know that VC company, private equity groups, uh, and industries are investing for the first half of this year, half a trillion US dollars into media, telecom, and technology sector. Now, if that stands to be the way that the second half of 2017 goes, it will be an all-time record high. So the momentum in the industry is tremendous. We are thriving on an increasing of digitization and more automation. Internet of Things is just around the corner. If um, 2G gave us mobility, remember 2G? Yeah. Uh, then we got 3G, uh, which gave us a half-baked uh, data usage, uh, but a little bit better speed. And then we got 5G, uh, no, sorry, 4G. And 4G is what we're doing right now. Now, it gave us better speed and lower latency, but the important thing is that we had one common technology globally, one common platform globally, which made that the platform economy, very much what you were alluding to, that the platform economy is creating a huge amount of energy and positivism in this energy. Now, what will happen with 5G? Question mark. Well, I think if 4G changed my life, 5G will change society because it is a connected society that we're entering into and 5G will play a super important role. So we are here for the long run and we are uniting the mobile industry to achieve the SDGs. Just for the record, I'm a 5G kind of girl. <laughs> Good for you. Good, yes. Fast. Good. Winnie Bianimo, Executive Director of Oxfam. So, you've listened to what your fellow panellists have to say. I know you are a woman who likes to rise to a challenge. So, perhaps you might tell us, you know, social dialogue, all very well, we like it. But where do you see the barriers and the challenges in, in achieving it? Did you want to answer that? Or I saw you taking notes. Would you like to say something else? No, I'm happy. That's fine. Okay, go. I'm happy to respond okay. to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, we've signed on to the global deal as Oxfam, and we are proud to, and we congratulate the Prime Minister of Sweden for his leadership on that. Social dialogue is the way forward. We have to talk, business, governments, and citizens, and work our way. 
out of a crisis of rising inequality, where we have a global economy that is funneling wealth to a few at the top and leaving so many behind. You know, the IMF recently released a report and said that one key driver of inequality has been the decline, guess what, of trade unions. This is the IMF. Now, if the IMF says yes. that we need more trade unions yes. and more collective bargaining, yeah. then you know there's a problem in the global economy. There has to be. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> I mean, we, Oxfam, we are committed to exposing this rising extreme inequality and the dangers it has to society and to sustainable growth and to fight for the rights of workers. Whether these are garment workers in Bangladesh or hotel cleaners in Thailand or even poultry workers here in the United States of America who are have, living on poverty wages. Yeah, yeah. We fight for them. Good. Some of them go to work in diapers because they are afraid of asking for a toilet break. Yeah. That's how bad it is. Yeah. Here in the richest country in the world, mm. it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So we'll fight, we'll fight for justice there. There has to be a way, there has to be businesses that will share value more equitably. Yeah. You know, the chief economist of the Bank of England release said this, it's not a, a statistic of Oxfam, that in 1970, companies in the UK took, gave their shareholders 10% of their profits. Today, that percentage is 70%. And that's the trend across the rich countries and the emerging countries, that more and more of the profits are going to shareholders, less and less to workers, less and less is invested back to grow the business, and it also encourages tax dodging. We have to get out of those business models. We have to think of different models, and there are there. And Oxfam, we have some experience in building different business models, and we are studying and trying to actually envisage more business models that are fair. We have come to accept that business must channel wealth to the owners of capital and cheat the other stakeholders. That's wrong. Let me give you an example. Oxfam in 1991, with others, formed a company called Cafe Direct. It's a cooperative. It gives a premium to coffee farmers it invests 50% of the profits back into communities. Two of the board seats are for the farmers, and the company publishes information about wage levels. No one, the top, the top worker doesn't earn more than 4.4% more than the bottom worker. Or the amount the bottom worker gets. There is a fair wage differential. These are things that can happen. You can take it to scale. There's a company called Mondragon, Spanish company, owned by 74,000 workers, employees. They democratically manage their cooperative. It's in industry, it's in finance, it is in knowledge production. It, it does a lot of value addition, but it's owned by its employees. The top owner, the CEO, the top worker, doesn't earn more than nine times more than the bottom. These are real businesses making $13 billion turnover. So we have to go away from exploiting exploitative businesses, and it can happen through social dialogue. Thank you, Winnie. You've given us some good case studies there. So 
Thank you very much indeed. You can stay relaxed. I'm going to go to the floor, though, because I think we've got a couple of interventions from the floor. I'd like to ask, first of all, the Vice President of Costa Rica, Vice President Chacon. Um, there's a microphone coming for you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam. Would you be so kind, perhaps, as to stand? It of would course. just help so people at the back can understand. Okay, thank you. So just a brief response, please, in response to what you've you've well, heard. I've been grateful, you know, hearing everybody. Just first of all, talking about justice, then talking about us, women, in the, in, in the workforce. It's very important to give us different opportunities. And another thing that's very important that Secretary has been talking about, it's equal pay for us women. That's another thing Absolutely. that we have to do. I love these words and I love these examples. You know, in Costa Rica, we just finished a new law that really gives us another opportunities for being in the workforce as women, especially taking care of our kids. That's very important. If we don't have where to leave our kids, we can't be in the workforce. And if we are not in the workforce, we are losing half of the workforce of the whole world. So mm -hmm. this is very important for us to do. Also, it's very important to have uh, and a knowledge in sexual rights and reproductive rights. So it's very important to take little, little girls into education, quality education, and then growing up knowing that we deserve to have the amount of kids that we can really take care. That's another very important thing. And having this opportunity to work, uh, to talk in the World Economic Forum, it's a great opportunity to think that we can build a better world. A better world that's, you know, made from women and from men, and that we can work in this. Another very important issue that you have uh, been talking is about technologies. You know, everybody needs to have technologies so they can reach the information. And that's another very important thing we have been doing in Costa Rica. Now, the gap between the people with uh, technologies and the poorest that they, they didn't used to have technologies, it's really a very small gap because with the politics I have been um, doing in Costa Rica, we are getting all the whole country connected. Mm. So the kids will have the same opportunity to learn, mm. to learn another language. We, we are trying to teach English as a second language in all our children, but also it's very important to be a competitive country. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I'm very grateful to see and to share with you what we are doing in a little country called Costa Rica, four and a half million people. We can have this as a laboratory, <laughs> but we are doing good things. And as vice president of my country, I'm really proud that these gaps are really getting shorter, smaller, and we are finding out a better society. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much indeed, very vice president. And indeed, you are very much a global laboratory because you have done so many good things in Costa Rica in, in setting an example of what could be done in so many ways, industrialization and so on. But let's go to the Netherlands. Lilian Plowman, you are the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development. Um, a brief yeah. response from you. Thank you for what you Thank you, you very heard. much. Uh, let me first thank uh, the Prime Minister of Sweden for taking this initiative. And I think uh, what makes the global deal uh, the Global Initiative Special is that it can bring together all kind of practical work that, has, that is being done. So now I'm not going to list what wonderful practical work the Netherlands is doing. I'm going to point out a bit more of a political issue that I think we need to address. You've been all talking about the social dialogue and we basically invented the social dialogue. Um, you've been talking about the problem of people becoming or countries becoming less unionized there is another issue that we need to address, that in too many countries, people are afraid to unionize um, in uh, themselves. They are afraid to organize themselves. They are, pre they are in real time punished for organizing themselves in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, at the places where they work. And I think not only politicians have a responsibility to fix that, we should, but also businesses and, of course, NGOs. And so yeah. now the World Economic Forum brings us together. We have this wonderful initiative. I do think that we need to get a little bit more political on this issue. So yeah. thanks. You've set the ball rolling there on the political. Thank you.
just pass the microphone to your fellow minister there on the side. Thank you, Dr. Bekele from Ethiopia, Minister for Water, Irrigation and Electricity. You're a busy man. That's a big portfolio. <laughs> All three. Yes, it is yes, inevitable. It is. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, for uh, your continued leadership in this uh, global deal. Um, uh, this is important uh, partnership, actually, to bring together everyone to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, the inclusive growth and uh, job creation is a very critical uh, issue for discussion. Uh, my country uh, is uh, rapidly, one of rapidly growing economies uh, in the world, um, about 8% uh, even in the difficult year. This has been continuing for the last 12 years. Uh, within this, uh, we see the importance of uh, <clears throat> uh, sectors like agriculture in African context to be productive enough. We have to uh, really create job opportunities through looking into agro-processing, value addition of agriculture, because uh, right now, 70% uh, of African population is actually engaged uh, as occupation in agriculture, but not productive enough in terms of productivity. Therefore, it is critical to really think that uh, agricultural productivity increases substantially. Africa should also uh, revolutionize in terms of industrialization, manufacturing, uh, service sectors, and so on. So in this also, we need to invest significantly. My country is uh, doing well uh, recently in terms of industrialization and manufacturing. Uh, currently, we are building 12 industrial parks. Uh, that would really create a decent job for uh, young people and women. Uh, the critical problem we have is unemployment. Uh, we are very successful in terms of education. Uh, for example, from three universities uh, about 10 years ago, we have now uh, about 50 public universities. So one of the target area 86 says, uh, uh, to mix employment uh, as well as education and the training. So we are doing very well in terms of education and training, but the uh, democratic, demographic dividend need to be harnessed yet through what we have established as uh, secondary and tertiary education, where a lot of um, young people are graduating from universities, but need to be employed through fast uh, uh, developing industry, manufacturing, and agro-processing, as I have said. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, that's what I, I said. You were busy. Say. You, you, yeah. you are <laughs> <laughs> certainly. Good luck. Yes, because huge population there in Ethiopia, about 90 million. So, yes, the challenge is great. John Irons, gentleman there, your director for inclusive economies at the Ford Foundation, and of course, this is about inclusive growth and decent work. So, um, just give us a quick rundown. Yeah, so I'm, I'm here um, uh, thinking about the impressive presentations we've heard today and thinking about the, the global deal and the components of that, right, which is just the questions, why partner and then why dialogue? And that's been what I'm trying to think about when thinking, listening to the presentations. So in why partnership, um, well, we're trying to solve what in philanthropy we would call wicked problems. Um, and I apologize, it probably does not translate well into many languages here, um, but a wicked problem is a problem that has no easy solution. There's no one way to solve it. And it really demands partnerships. It demands that people bring different skills to the table, different expertise, and different perspectives. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, secondly, why dialogue? Why is that important? Um, we heard about several of the, what I would call the drivers of inequality, the drivers of the problems we see today, be it uh, lack of unionization or others. At Ford, we often talk about the five drivers of inequality being entrenched cultural narratives, failure to invest in public goods, unfair rules of the economy, unequal access to government decision-making and resources, and persistent prejudice and discrimination. So I challenge you to, do, to deal with any one of those problems without dialogue. Mm -hmm. Dialogue has to be a part of every one of those problems and, and more. Okay. So, but we also need, uh, I would call it directed dialogue, dialogue with a purpose. Um, and I think the SDGs, as you've heard today, in some sense provides that purpose, provides a framework for which we can not just talk about things in the abstract, but can really aim them towards towards solutions, um, so that we can create the more inclusive economies we'd all like to see. Yeah. 
Thank you very much indeed, um, John. And, and now for our closing remarks, we are absolutely delighted to have in our midst, and may I invite her to the lectern, um, somebody, of course, who was absolutely instrumental in providing the framework of the SDGs, um, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, also a former cabinet minister in her native Nigeria, amongst many other accolades you have, which are far too numerous to mention. But Amina, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, and, and excellencies, ladies and friends, but mostly a lot of friends in, in this audience, and I know that I'm standing between you and many receptions. Uh, this has been really um, enlightening for us and engaging, and I think when we, the temperature was raised, it was also good for all of us, um, just waking us up to what the, the deal was about. And I do want to thank um, the Prime Minister of Sweden, because I remember him bringing people onto the stage in 2015 and making a commitment. And here we are today with a full room, and really those commitments are beginning to be realized, and we still have a long way to go, but it's the partnerships. And, and, and thank you, uh, World Economic Forum, for doing that. I, I have this wonderful speech that my great team wrote, so I'm going to put it to one side, because it really um, doesn't capture anywhere near the kind of commitments and passion we're seeing in the room today. Um, leaders are here from different parts, maybe not enough women, but we are here around not enough young people, um, but yeah, speaking. Um, the global deal and social dialogue imperatives both, and they have to be well and truly connected, and it cannot be a sterile dialogue. I think we've heard that from everyone, that it's got to be meaningful. And, and for us, we believe that people at the center of that dialogue is essential. People that are given respect, that are given dignity, um, that are allowed uh, to, to actualize justice in, social globali in globalization and to do it without fear. And I think that this is what happens at the many countries that we have. The minute we talk about inclusive consultations and dialogues to get us into a place where we will have equal access to whatever it is that we have, then the barriers start to come up. And very, very quickly, we, make, um, we justify the barriers. And so I think that this discussion brings us to what we already have, which took us four years to get, and that's the SDG framework. It's an amazing framework, and it is a consensus of 193 countries that didn't have to sign a legal document. So it is one that we're all wedded to. We don't need any more resolutions. We don't have to go negotiate anymore, cross any T's or dot any I's. We have it. And that's what we can call um, leaders to. That's what we should be saying the political space needs to be opened up for, is implementation of those commitments that were made in 2015. Not just the 2030 agenda, but the climate uh, Paris agreement as well, and the financing agreement in Addis, and a numerous other um, resolutions that we added to that. With the 2030 agenda, we don't just have 17 goals and you pick one. You have 17 entry points as a response to the context and challenges that we have in the world today. And that's what's exciting about them, is that there isn't any one goal that doesn't matter to our seven billion. And we have different levels of priorities that we would put them, but as a whole, they're all really important. And I think that we can make them exciting, we can um, find the solutions, um, and certainly uh, become much more fit for purpose to engage with implementation. Not in New York. Yes, I know we have some dire consequences in the United States. We've left many people behind. But really, when you map the world, we know and have the data to, to go where we need to go. We know where those who are really left behind in dire straits are. And so I think that when we talk about the unions, we have to be fit for purpose today. Is it the unions of today or the unions of yesterday? And I think that we, I'm just, I'm not picking on you because I'm, you know, I can tell you about the unions in my country, but I am saying that because of that, the UN has to think about whether it's fit for purpose with its over 30 odd um, um, organizations and institutions. It's why we're doing the reform now. Um, and we ask the question, do you think that you are implementing the SDGs? 90% came back and said, yes, we're doing the SDGs. And, and consultants came back, experts came back and said, no, you're not, you're doing MDGs plus. I think we need to have an honest conversation, look in the mirror and see across the globe, what are we doing? Are we, have, have we got the skill sets? Have we got the narrative? Have we got the mindset to really engage with this new agenda that took all of us a long time to agree to? And very quickly, we're finding people slipping back into the old ways to think that they could implement this new agenda. 
it is absolutely not possible. We really have to stretch. It is painful. It is transitional. Um, in many cases, it will take a long time for us to run with it. We'll be crawling and walking, but it's worth it. It's worth it because those seven billion people are no longer in a place that they can't reach you. There are no borders in this world for the catastrophes and the problems that we have. What happens in one country today can visit you in another country overnight. It can do it across the internet, it can do it across borders, we're seeing it today. And I think that this is where we need to look at the opportunity that these goals create for businesses and partnerships. For businesses to put people at the center, to have that social dialogue that is, that is genuine and continuous, not a one-off, um, and that we can uh, bring all sorts of stakeholders into the room and not have siloed dialogue either. There are many convenings that we have when we only put one sort of people in the room and then we have another dialogue and then someone has to put all those threads together and they very often don't interpret them the right way if, as if you were all in the same room. So really defining the kind of dialogues that we have. Political space we absolutely need. Um, the political space to bring in those that are on the outside. And, and I do think that in many cases, um, that political space isn't open uh, for unions that it needs to be. I think there's a huge opportunity in the labor force for what we can do and build on what has been successful. But I think youth are missing. Youth are being spoken about and we're asking, they're saying how important they are today, not tomorrow, they need to be at the table. And then suddenly it's very difficult to bring them to the table very difficult to give them a position on the table. What do we want them to talk about? Um, and I think that, you know, in, in creating the agenda for a conversation or social dialogue, they should be there creating that agenda and not just be asked in after the agenda has been created. And, and, and there are examples of how this is happening really well, but they, they are key and they need to be there. The advent of, of, um, of the digital world and the, the frontier issues that we're all dealing with now um, can, can allow us to leapfrog. Today we heard about digital finance and how women and young people and entrepreneurs can have access to that. And so that's exciting, but it really needs to be thought through what the implications are and how we need to get that on the road. Um, but I think that it also raises um, a number of other issues um, in terms of the opportunities that could be um, available to us today. We speak about the 2030 agenda and we go off into another room and talk about climate change. Um, it's one and the same. I can tell you in our countries that when we want to put a pipeline of projects together, it is not NDC's and 2030 agenda. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. A solar power project, a transportation project, a health project, all of them are related to both. And so having that alignment um, and using the opportunities of NDC's to say that we can attain the 2030 goal. Um, we've tried now to, to put in, um, I, I want to go back just quickly to the digital finance piece. What has that raised? It's raised the issue of skills and education. I hear us talking about education. Um, maybe I won't say this as the, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, but as Amina Mohammed, I will tell you that education is in crisis all over the world. We have to rethink education. What kind of skills are we saying that our young people need to have for these new frontier, um, um, frontiers that we have, the new jobs, the new economies? Um, are we going to be left behind because we don't have those skills? There's an opportunity now that we have millions of young people with the wrong set of skills, with a bad quality education, really bad. Employers will tell us about it. Now's an opportunity to retool, to reskill to actually join up in a social dialogue with unions to say what should the labor force look like across the world in different places to engage these young people who can live their, um, their aspirations. Finally, I just want to encourage everyone to continue what you're doing bigger and better if it's in line with a genuine social dialogue for the global deal and to use the Secretary General's convening power, his political capital, uh, to bring that together at the country level. We're committed to making sure that we have a new generation of country teams with resident coordinators that can do just that. Coordinate a, um, a, a, a number of institutions with the capacities and the expertise that we have a symphony and not a cacophony as we often have these days. Um, but we promise you that we're, we're up front there, we're ready to lead on it, and we really encourage all of you to come into this. The SDGs really will deliver us to the promised land. Thank you. Deputy Secretary General, thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Secretary General. I, I think that uh, has rounded off this discussion on advancing the um, global deal uh, very, very well. I thank all my panelists and uh, those of you who've contributed from the floor. Um, please, those of you who, who spoke, would you be so kind as to come onto the stage for a group photograph? Uh, but it just remains for me, Zain Abadawi, to say it's been my pleasure to be with all of you and I wish you a very successful and productive um, General Assembly 2017. Thank you.